Believe it or not, for me, uh, I'm not like a student. I've never looked at any charts in my life. That's pretty amazing. It's mainly, I think, the life experience and uh, quick math. Hey guys, Connor Richards of Poker News here with another episode of Life Outside Poker. My guest for this episode is Raminder Singh, aka The Rominator. Now, Raminder bills himself as an amateur poker player, but he's really anything but that. He's won nearly 100 live tournaments, and he gave me a tour of his massive trophy collection to prove it. He does this all while running a business full-time and raising a family. Let's get into it. So, since we're doing this here at your beautiful home in South Florida, let's maybe start things off here. How long have you been living in South Florida? Thank you. Yeah, I moved to Florida in uh, 2005, actually. Um, there was a need of the hour. I was uh, looking for a stable, like, permanent job. I was into Big Five Consulting. Um, I moved to New York uh, a while ago, um, and uh, then I was into consulting, traveling in the back of the plane for 10-plus uh, years, and then um, yeah, decided to get into the corporate world. So Florida offered me that, one of the companies here, and uh, they hired me as a director, so I moved here in uh, 2005. So almost getting to 20 years almost. That's a, that's a long time. And before that, you mentioned you were born in India? Yes. Uh, I was born in uh, New Delhi, uh, capital of India, uh, 1974, almost 50 this year, getting to senior years. And um, uh, I basically did my education uh, as well as uh, I was brought up there um, uh, until I was an adult close to that age uh, and my education uh, was done in uh, New Delhi as well. And how old were you when you left India? I left India at the age of 20. So after my graduation, first job, uh, some experience and uh, then I left India. I went to Barbados for a couple of years. Uh, I worked there as an IT consultant weekdays and weekend there used to be uh, some fun cricket league, uh, not the top level league, international level or uh, high club level. Uh, it was a B grade uh, league, but pretty competitive cricket. Uh, so I played there uh, for some time before moving to US. That's so exciting. So yeah, competitive cricket. What got you interested in cricket? Well, if you look at uh, India and cricket, there is a bond. So even though hockey, uh, field hockey might be India's uh, national sport, but cricket is uh, is the main sp uh, dominant sport. And you play cricket on streets there, in parks, anywhere. If you ever visit India, you'll see everybody loves playing cricket. So that's one of the bugs. It's like a religion in, in India. So most uh, kids growing up there, they follow cricket or they play cricket. So I was also equally interested in that uh, growing up. Yeah, cricket isn't as big of a sport in the U.S., but I know it's big in places like Britain and the United Kingdom. I didn't realize it was a big deal in India, but it sounds like it's a pretty big deal there. It absolutely is. And uh, uh, India was ruled by Britain, uh, England, for 200 years, as you can imagine. Anywhere, anywhere England went, they left a footprint of cricket. Uh, believe it or not, Australia, they are the real killers in cricket. Oh, okay. Australia are the ultimate world champions. And then come India, England, uh, uh, like nations. And uh, then we have uh, other, other powers too, superpowers like uh, South Africa, uh, New Zealand, uh, Pakistan, they play uh, Sri Lanka and uh, other countries. But Australia are the ultimate champions of cricket in World Cups. And you mentioned your first job in India. What was that? Was that in the IT field? Yeah, I started off, uh, uh, my background is uh, uh, mainly uh, mechanical engineering, and I did uh, computer engineering uh, alongside um, and, and some other, uh, other degrees. But my main job was to be the production supervisor at uh, Timex Watches Limited. Oh, wow. Uh, there was a watch company. And I was a supervisor there uh, with specialization in industrial engineering. So that was a very suitable role. I enjoyed that. But uh, one of the weekends, uh, uh, our uh, director there of uh, assembly, uh, who, who is responsible for all these uh, numbers of watches and volume every day, he needed report 
uh, a report, and that was Fox Pro was the program and RDBMS. It's it's an IT term, and I happened to have that experience. And IT team didn't have the bandwidth to do that um, program for him or that report out for him. So I worked weekend and produced that nice fancy dashboard, and that uh, unfortunately hurt him because the director of uh, IT department got to know about me. He interviewed me and he moved me into IT within few months of that job. So that's how I started off as an as a mechanical engineer, call it, or assembly supervisor, and moved into information technology. So you've done many different things. You've lived lots of different places. After you were in Barbados and playing cricket, you came to the U.S. I think you said that New York was the first place you came? New York City um, is amazing. But yeah, my port of entry was uh, JFK uh, Kennedy. I lived in Queens. Um, in New York. I still remember Lefferts Boulevard, Kew Gardens um, in mid-90s. Yes, that was my first job there with a with an IT consulting company. What was that like for you? There was a big change. And obviously, if you live in uh, countries like Barbados before that, obviously that's a dream for somebody yeah. to play cricket and um, uh, to be able to be an IT consultant uh, to do 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 your job and and to be able to learn new uh, new programs and new languages in IT and all that was great. But moving to US, obviously, you know, it's a it's a country of opportunity, right? And with my background, family background in India, that was a great opportunity, monetary, you know, money wise, financially, that was really great. And uh, obviously, New York, I still think one of the best cities to live in the world. So. That was really great, getting to New York and uh, then getting to know the culture, learn about subways, ENF trains. So that taught me a lot, getting my social security number on H-1B visa and all, going to work day one. So I was a turbaned Sikh that time, different mm. look with beard and all. So that was, uh, that, was, that was amazing, you know, and New York and U.S. is obviously uh, the best country to live in. People don't realize uh, anybody who says, you know, anything negative about this country or, uh, you know, they, they don't want to live here. I mean, my message is this is the best country to live in. And uh, I'm, I'm really proud to move here. And it does seem that that is the dream for many people around the world to come to the U.S., specifically to come to New York. Was that difficult, though, coming to a big city and not having any family here or any connections? Um, yeah, at the beginning, um, um, I got uh, into an apartment uh, that was provided by our employer that, that time. And yeah, it wasn't easy in the beginning, you know, not having uh, formal like, you know, beds or uh, on, a, on a mattress, you know, no pillow, no blankets in the beginning, first couple months until you earn your salary. Uh, they were super nice to us, though, you know, so they arranged the best they could. Um, so it was, it was a brand new, new experience to me. Uh, but overall, um, obviously, you miss your family at that age. But at the same time, the excitement of the opportunity in front of you, that keeps you going. So I was equally excited and motivated. Uh, and uh, that was really the starting point, you know, of my career. And I, I grabbed that opportunity with both my hands and a couple other people who joined the company along with me. And we're recording this at your beautiful house here. And you're a family man. I was talking with your, your nice wife, who's from Eastern Europe. How did you two meet? Oh, that, that, that's a great question. Um, uh, that was in, uh, I think, around 2006. I moved to Florida in uh, 2005. And uh, 2006, it, it happens when you're, I think people say you're, you found, find someone when you're really not l looking forward to someone, meeting somebody, it happens. Uh, you know, and it did. So um, I was in a, in a, in a long-term relationship, um, my ex fiance she moved here with me, and then she didn't like it here. She was more into modeling and all, too hot for her. She, she, she moved back, and uh, that time I was, wasn't looking forward to meeting anyone, but uh, one of my friends here, uh, they had a uh, party, 4th of July, a lot of hot dogs and a lot of, uh, you know, good stuff there to, to, to you know, to celebrate and uh, for New Year's. And uh, I ended up in line, food line, hot dog line behind uh, Delia. And she happened to be the friend of uh, some other guests there. And uh, we started chatting and uh, then we never, never looked back. 
That's a pretty great uh, meeting story. You met in a hot dog line. That's that's amazing. <laughs> yes, that was uh, that was Fourth of July party, and uh, I wasn't even planning on going to that party, but uh, decided pull myself uh, you know out of the house, and I'm glad I went there, and uh, uh, got to meet her. She was leaving for Romania within like a week or so, so I ended up uh, meeting her a couple of times before that. He once at Hard Rock. Oh, wow. Yeah, Full she came circle. over to Hard Rock uh, there. And uh, then I picked her up when she came back from Romania. I picked her up from the airport. Uh, her flight got changed. I think she was going to come over to Fort Lauderdale. Then they, I think, redirected it to West Palm Beach, Palm Beach International Airport. So I drove uh, that way and then, you know, a little north and picked her up. And she appreciated it. And, uh, and then we started bonding and... Uh, Slowly, you know, then I proposed to her and that was her condition to move in, you know. Uh, so I, I proposed to her uh, on a nice beach um, and uh, here we are. And it sounds like this is all before poker became a part of your life? Yes, uh, very true. Uh, that time I knew poker because I knew basics of poker. And I'll tell you a story about my friend who got me into poker in a bar poker league. Um, but I didn't play much poker. I played at Bellagio a tournament I cashed in 2006. I, I did see that friends. on your hand in mob, yeah. yeah. That was my very first one. Then I took a very long break. I didn't, didn't play much. I'll just show up for uh, some cash game. And that time you could buy in for $100 max. And I started max. learning. Yeah, here, that was, the, that was the, I think, limitation. But you can max buy in was 100 So I started uh, playing some of that uh, my free time. But a corporate job, when you're in a corporate job and you have an entire team, 100 plus people counting on you, it's very hard. And many times you you got to give in your weekends and time, you know, and it's uh, demanding. And I was uh, uh, growing up in my career uh, from consulting to corporate job. And uh, I wanted to play poker, but uh, it was it was very difficult for me that time. So that is a lot to balance. Family full-time job and also playing poker as we'll get into you call yourself a poker amateur uh i think that could be debatable because you have won dozens uh maybe how many tournaments have you won do you know yeah actually i gave that stat to uh to somebody uh, recently for for an interview um so if you look at my hand and mob uh, uh, the total count is around 90 94 wow and uh, the majors the series tournament like the hard rock series that's going on if if you have to talk about the series tournament or the majors that's 64 that's that's pretty incredible especially like like i mentioned you're working a full time job you have a family and you still find time to win around 100 tournaments that's that's quite an accomplishment yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. And I give credit to my family for that, uh, especially my wife, who, who takes care of a lot of things. Um, if you ask my kids, they'll joke about it. In the house, there's a mommy and there are three kids. <laughs> Yours truly. So in a way, you know, we are that family. Um, I'm very thankful to have that support. Uh, and you're right. I mean, if you look at uh, going back into corporate time from 2005 till 2012, I was a corporate executive, more like a CIO or VP of IT. But then I started my own business, 2012, IT consulting. That was really demanding. And uh, that's where family support is very important. And uh, uh, Delia, she's the CFO, majority owner of most of our businesses, 51%. We are women-owned. And uh, uh, thanks to her again. So I uh, had to work very hard, and you can see on my hand in 12, 13, 14, 15, you won't see a lot of volume of tournaments. Starting 15, 16, I started playing more tournaments over the weekends and uh, even weekdays, later edge, and uh, started playing and uh, have some success. I still consider myself as a recreational player or an amateur. Once an amateur is an amateur. So uh, I, I, I am a true poker amateur, as you can see on my Facebook, uh, Twitter. So I consider myself as a recreational player uh, still until I retire and perhaps get into playing those serious tournaments, those 5Ks, 10Ks, uh, those I love at Aria and all that I see. And I think a lot of, uh, of course, you're an amateur, not a professional, but a, a lot of professional poker players, I think what they like about it is the independence. They get to be their own boss. You hear that from a lot of 
poker players. Was that a similar inspiration for you in starting your own business? Did you want that independence? Did you want to be your own boss? Absolutely. So uh, with my experience in Big Five Consulting with companies like Ernst & Young, Capgemini and all that, they taught me a lot. That was the foundation of my career. Uh, so you learn about consulting, like how to manage your clients, deal with your client. Then you become a client as a CIO, right? You are the buyer, you are the client. So with that experience, um, in 2000, late 2011 and 12, we got that opportunity, myself and you know some of my partners and all. We got that opportunity and a couple of very good clients. And we are like, we know what these big clients require a supplier to do for them, their pain points, right? We know that and I know that. Maybe I can fix their main pain points, right? What keeps you up at night, Mr. Client, Mr. CIO, you know, work-wise, what can I do to help you? And if you can solve those problems, take those pain points and those solutions in your presentations, in your offerings to the clients, they'll obviously they'll know that you, you know their stuff and you can help them. Whether it's McKinsey, Accenture, any big companies competing with you, you know, maybe their boilerplate, cookie cutter, you know, solution, one solution uh, for all. Um, and you give them a specialized solution that's going to fix their pain point. And you go in with that approach, you're bound to win most times. So that worked in my favor, my prior experience, uh, being a client myself as a customer and uh, being a provider as well. So that gave me motivation and uh, uh, encouragement to uh, continue to evolve and build this business. Uh, so that's why I spend a lot of time day and night, Connor, I can tell you. It's uh, like three to four hours of sleep and weekends and all. And you won't see much poker on my resume in uh, uh, 2011, 12, 13, that time frame. One Z, two Z, you know, I'll play tournaments, but it's all that time business. Building your team, finding the best people, serving your clients the best you can. On a, on a New Year's Eve, there's a go-live going on for a client. You make yourself available. You are there with them to make sure that's successful. So that kind of commitment is needed, not just in IT consulting, my, my world, but in any world, if you want to be successful, I believe. What sort of lessons from your professional career uh, have you taken and applied to poker? Do you think that your, the business side of things has helped you with your poker journey? It has helped me tremendously. Um, so when, when I think of poker or look at poker, the variance, the ups and downs that we have, everybody has that, right? Mm -hmm. Some people think, oh, somebody's running well, winning tournaments, or somebody's not running well, and this is a very unlucky guy. I think in the end, it's arbitrage. The bad beats will happen to everyone. Nobody will be spared. We know that, right? Business is the same. So I learned that in business. You're about to sign a multi-million dollar program for next three years with a client. And here, you know, you go in and here you have your uh, competitor winning that uh, deal right in front of you for whatever reason, right? It happens. The client pr preferred to choose them. So it happens. Then you got to still, you know, believe in yourself and work on the next deal. Poker tournaments are the same. No matter how well you play, you, you can play your best on a given day you can still lose to a bad beat. We all know that. You play poker, you know that. So I'm just uh, giving that as an example to relate to business and in life, life is the same. You know, I learned that uh, growing up uh, in India and uh, my father, and, and we'll, we'll get into that, uh, you know, when you ask me the question on family and all that time, but giving an example uh, on my parents, we grew up very poor and my father and mother, they are the inspiration, the way they raised us with very limited resources and to give us the best education possible and the, the best. Uh, they couldn't give us the, you know, nice clothes, maybe, you know, brand new, you know, jackets and, uh, you know, for, uh, for attending weddings and all, for functions and all. Uh, they couldn't give us those, uh, those great things other kids had my age, but they gave us the best education. So again, that gave me a lot of inspiration to do well in business and same business lessons can be applied in poker. And I see it, anytime I lose to a bad beat, it's okay, you know, that's part of it. You, you go home with a smile, 
and then then you come back in next day. And it sounds like your upbringing instilled a very strong work ethic in you as well. Thanks. I think that's all uh, all because of I give credit and and share to like my father. Uh, he was an auto rickshaw driver uh, for decades. Uh, if you know about New Delhi, summertime the temperature goes till almost 48 50 degrees Celsius, which is close to 120 125 with heat index. Wow. Yes. And uh, winter time it's close to 1 or 2 degrees Celsius again uh, close to like here in US uh, close to zero right close to 4 or 5 degrees right so it's uh, it's in it, it goes goes into 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 negative some places in India but Delhi is a is a is a is a state is a place where it's extreme hot and extreme cold right so he was riding that auto rickshaw in uh, June July in that uh, extreme heat as well as winter time, you have to do it, you know, as a, as a provider with four kids. I have two older sisters, um, uh, Navdeep, uh, Jagdeep, and my brother, Sarabjit. All, all three of them, and including me, they gave us the best education possible. Even the computer degree I told you about, I was able to clear the scholarship exam, but not at 100%. So I got 50% off by giving a competition exam. Um, and... 50% still needed to be provided. He didn't even care. Whatever savings he had, he, he took that money, he loaned some money from a, from a friend, he gave it to me. I remember that, 20,000 rupees that time, which was a big amount. And I mean, today it's like nothing. It's like $250 of, uh, for today, but that time was, was a lot in early 90s. He didn't, he didn't flinch, he didn't even care, even 1%. He said, you want to do another degree? Uh, evening time, you want to do this computer course, that's your dream, I'll fulfill that for you. For those things, they never cared. So uh, that helped a lot. And uh, I, when I talk to my nephews, I talk to the young ones, that's what I tell them, even in poker. If, uh, if you don't have to quit your job, you know, you have a, you know, ongoing income on the side, try to find ways, you know, to play poker weekends, evenings and all, but have that income, you know there and i tell my nephews the same never quit your jobs for uh, just for poker i love poker but at the same time you know have this st stability so my father he provided us with that and i'm very thankful and very very proud of him and my mother who was a housemaker so you mentioned yeah your nephews have gotten into poker you said that they're catching up to you they have a few trophies of their own so it sounds like poker seems to run in the family a bit Yes, they followed, uh, they followed me on that uh, a bit. Um, uh, after I learned, I mean, uh, there was a story, uh, uh, my boss at the corporate job, he got me into poker. He gave my name for a, for a bar poker league. I didn't know how to spell poker. So he said, come over. Uh, there was Gatsby's, the, the, the club here, uh, 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 or a bar where they played poker in Boca Raton. Like, I gave your name up. And uh, I'll explain to you the rules. So he explained to the, me the rules on the back of a napkin. I played that tournament, ended up winning that tournament somehow, beating Kings with 3-5 off and all. So that was my entry into poker there. But my nephews, they followed the same. I coached them the same way. Like I got them into poker a little bit uh, when they came here to US. Even back in India, my nephew Sandy, he's pretty good, but he's into IT. He's my IT partner right now. He's, he runs the India branch for us, along with a couple other folks, Neeraj and all, who are really good leaders there. And uh, uh, other nephews, Harry and Japanese, they are here. Um, and uh, Harry has won a WSOP circuit ring. Oh, wow. And Japanese is also very good. In, they used to live in Tampa, now they have moved to Austin. They go to the lodge. Mm. They play there once in a while, uh, very highly rated, and hopefully I'll, I'll get to play there uh, too soon, once in a while. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit more about first getting into poker. You mentioned you won that first tournament, and that's those bar, bar poker tournaments are, are interesting because uh, a lot of time, you know, like you mentioned, you had 3-5 off. You don't really know what people are going to show up with. That probably gave you a lot of experience playing a more player-specific exploitative style, would you say that? Yes, uh, I played in that league for a couple of years off and on because some of my colleagues and clients, they used to play that. My boss that time, he used to come over here and uh, play in that league. He didn't live here in Boca Raton, but he'll travel. So that was, uh, he was more like my friend. He still is one of my best friends. So 
he got me into it and that was the inspiration to do well against him because he's your idol he taught you you want to beat him in poker so used to play extra hard against him get lucky once in a while so yes that gave me a lot of experience playing these small tournaments and to be able to read your opponents a little bit more live poker i'm not an online poker player i don't like online unless i can look at the face it's very hard for me to play i'll be honest with you i may not even be a good online player if i decide to play so for me bar poker league gave me that um where i can leverage my experience from the past and uh, also understand the human aspect and uh, play the players at times not your hands so that was that was very instrumental and uh, that helped me a lot to your question and looking at your hand and mob you mentioned you you have so many victories but what's interesting is there are so many more first places than second places third places you seem to be a player who really closes things out what is your final table strategy and you know you mentioned there's so much variance in tournaments how do you seem to always get it done well on final table uh, you got to be very attentive more attentive than normal uh, because there are many phases of tournament you got to divide it into into various parts i have divided it into i mean i'm not going to discuss the whole strategy here we don't, don't have enough don't time. give away all your secrets Thanks. so i have divided any poker tournament into five phases right normally there are four quarters people do four i have five different phases one of the phases is pre bind phase right where reg is open for uh, for unlimited or you can fire multiple bullets you can play differently in that phase you don't have to go all in every hand but you can play slightly differently then there are different phases right final three tables and before that getting into money and all there are five stages for me so the final table uh, stage is the final stage out of that like 9 to 3 right those are the two steps so from 9 to 3 is a is a is a very critical uh, moment for you obviously bad beats are equal for everyone in the long run i believe right some are little luckier than others but if you play 1000 tournaments in the end it's arbitrage it's going to apply to everyone but to be very attentive there to be able to read your opponents uh, well and uh, i don't like to be on uh, electronics on phones many times you see there are final tables i like to focus on other players their chip stacks you got to know their chip stacks uh, bet sizing is the key it's it's key for for any phase of the tournament but when the tables are broken and all those are new tables that will happen but final table nobody is going anywhere they are there till the end of the tournament that's where you can leverage your strategy and you can pay some more attention to stack sizing bet sizing the type of players and uh, derive your strategy and very quickly you know for every player on the table how you want to play against every player so that's that's very important advantage for me is i play against many locals here who i have played against in the past so if they end up on the final table i have a fair idea how how they play a lot of them and uh, they also know how i play at times so you got to outthink and uh, again play your best and you mentioned the locals here florida of course has a very thriving poker scene here in south florida there are a lot of places to play how would you describe florida poker to someone from las vegas or someone who hasn't played out here what are the differences florida florida poker is booming Florida poker scene is booming especially in tournaments i don't play a lot of, a lot of cash mm -hmm. you'll see me once a year twice a year when i'm waiting for some buddies or if there's a break in you know i busted early waiting for a buddy you know uh, you'll see me hang out there uh, supporting my nephews or uh, once in a while but uh, florida tournament scene is amazing connor one series ends like hard rock is ending now starts the money maker tour next um uh, tony burns he'll run it at uh, at uh, palm beach kennel club a nice place to play poker uh, then comes the harris series then comes the back to hard rock there there are other places coconut creek they run their series denia they have some decent tournaments little far for me i don't go there go there a lot but uh, these are the places so um here we have like continuous availability of good tournaments uh, that i like personally enjoy between Uh, say 200 to couple thousand bucks buy in uh, so 
that's happening every time. So even if you take a break because of family reasons or I have to go to India, we have to go to Romania or for my work if I'm traveling and all, come back and hop into a tournament, late reg. So that works out well. Vegas, I know some. I won some tournaments there, but my experience in Vegas is very limited. I go there for WSOP for a few days max a year. Um, or when I was invited to uh, run Good Pro M, mm. that was a great, great time with folks like uh, Tana Karn, yes. Boston Rob. He's an amazing character. Uh, so I ended up winning that Pro M, uh, the Stanley Cup like trophy. It's a small, small tournament, but that's one of the best trophies there. So those are fond memories in Vegas. But uh, Vegas, I think they have good nightlies and all, but Florida poker uh, scene is completely booming on tournaments, in my opinion. And I encourage anyone and everyone who loves tournament poker to come over to Florida at Hard Rock and all these other properties and play some tournaments here. Let's stay on poker in Florida. You have you were showing me your incredible trophy collection, which uh, we'll get some video of. It, it seems like you know there are some players who say that they don't care about the trophies; they just want the money. You know, they'll they'll take a deal if it, they don't they won't worry about getting the trophy. They just want the highest payout. You seem to be really motivated to, to, to win those trophies. Is that the case? Yes. Um, uh, and there's a reason for that too. Uh, I, I'm a competitive person in life in general with my upbringing and all uh, a little bit competitive. I consider myself. Plus I have my kids, uh, my daughter who is into various fields like math competition. She was into ice skating because of school. She's not doing a lot. She still does. Uh, my son is into swimming and math competition and all. They have their own trophy cases, and I'll show you those too. So we have a very healthy competition going on as father and um, daughter and son. So uh, obviously I want them to do well. I want them to beat me, but I still want to compete against them. So winning a trophy does help. When I bring a trophy home, they see it too, and they, they, they want to do well in their respective uh, fields as well. Uh, so that helps uh, from that angle. Um, uh, plus, if you if you think about it, Connor, max money normally comes with the trophy, whether it's an outright win or whether it's a it's a it's a deal, a two way or three way deal, right? Nobody's given a trophy with less money in 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 most cases versus a second or third place, right? Even if it's a deal, it's an ICM deal. You're getting the most money. For me, money equals trophy. So if you're winning a trophy, you're getting the max payout anyway, in my opinion. And that's, if you think about it logically, that'll make sense. That does make sense to a lot of people. People who say, I want the max money, not the trophy. How can you get max money without the trophy? Only maybe in 0.5% of the cases, but 99.5%, if you win the first place, you're winning the trophy, you're getting the max money anyways. That's, so that's how I look at it. You have a very competitive drive, and I think it's very good to be a competitive person. One thing that does tend to happen, though, I think with competitive people is if they hit a roadblock or they experience failure, they can get discouraged or it can really be unmotivating. How how do you deal with failure and how how do you recover from, from things like that? Yes, that, that happens to everyone. As we discussed earlier, that's part of life experience, not just poker. Right. So I've seen that with my upbringing that I that I discussed with you early on, a lot of ups and downs in life, like uh, for anyone. Right. But in poker, it happens more often than you can imagine or you want it to be. You go on a on a variance where you have like your aces and kings getting cracked late in the tournament, close to money. The one you are like a chip leader of. And boom, you're out within within two hands. It does happen. But that's the time to keep your chin up. That's the time to remember you gave your best. That's the best you could have done. Things that are in your control, you worry about. Things that are not in your control, you're all in with aces versus ace king on a pre-flop. You don't know what five cards will come, right? You know, you, can, you don't control that. You don't worry about it. Okay, so if somebody somebody hits a Broadway against you, right? Queen Jack 10 by river. So be it. Next day you come back in thinking you did your best. You put your chips in uh, the best, in a best case scenario. Same with business and, and life. I, I tell my kids the same, my nephews the same. So you got to stay positive. 
during those times. Always stay positive and believe in yourself and your capability. Always. That's great advice for anyone, but especially poker players, because like you mentioned, the the bad luck happens all the time in poker and mindset is, is an important thing. Would you say you have a pretty positive mindset in poker? Yes, I would, I would, I would agree with that. I concur because uh, that comes from my family, from my, from my father and mother. My father is one of the strongest persons on planet if you talk about like mental strength. He's one of the strongest. Uh, the things he has done for his family, he had like five younger sisters and he was doing his degree in, and, and he left his school and college to support them, to get them married in India that time, if you go back. He was the same with my sister. So he's one of the strongest persons. I get it from him. And uh, for that reason, I mean, you got to be mentally strong um, going into these competitions, into these uh, bigger tournaments and all. Bad luck, bad beats do happen equally to everyone, uh, as I said earlier. But you come back. How strongly you come back? That's what matters and counts counts the most. And, and, and most people can with a strong mindset. And anyone who plays poker tournaments knows that uh, there's a very technical aspect to it. You need to know your 10 big blind strategy, 15 big blind strategy. How did you figure all that out? That, that can't just come naturally. <clears throat> Believe it or not, for me, uh, I'm not like a student. I've never looked at any charts in my life. That's pretty amazing. Never, ever I've looked at a chart, even today. And uh, for me, it's mainly, I think, the life experience and uh, quick math in your mind. I'm, I'm pretty good at math. Uh, my kids are, I think that's why they are in math competitions, you can see. Um, I think good genes from Romania to my wife. <laughs> She's into accounting and all. I give her most credit for that. But uh, quick math, when you, learn, when you learn to play poker, I strongly believe the calculation of blockers, right? Mm. What's blocking your hand, what your, your opponent may have, right? If you have a nine, two nines, two straight, two blockers in your hand, that's part of natural calculation. There's nothing new that's invented that we hear about. Oh, this guy has two blockers. Lately, we have started talking, you know, I saw some clips my nephew sent me. Oh, th this guy has blockers, you know, he should call an all-in bet there. No, you win and lose by very thin margin in this game. These blockers and these, uh, you know, number of big blinds and a lot of these stats are important, but those are basics, common sense, one-on-one. And a lot of those are lately, I think, are overrated, in my opinion, for somebody to even call off an all-in bet just based on, you know, what you have in your hand. Yes, that's information, very important. But are you going to base your tournament life on that? So when I hear that uh, a little bit, I tell my nephews and my close ones, I'm like, follow the advice, follow the charts and all, but go with your instinct. In the end, if your gut is telling you and your read is telling you to, to go with a decision, you may be wrong one time, but most times you'll be right. So I strongly believe in that. So I decline to, and, and obviously I don't even have time with being a CEO of a management consulting company, a mid-sized company, family across the oceans and all. I don't even, even have time to like go back and study or look into these charts and all. So I just go with my natural instincts and natural strategy. And that's why I play live poker. I'm, I'm, I'm never going to be able to play online poker. I think I'll be very bad with that. That's, that's pretty incredible that you say you haven't looked at charts and you're doing this off a of natural instinct. So just to kind of uh, give an example or a scenario, let's say you're at a final table, maybe you're four or five handed, folds to you in late position and you have 10 or 15 big blinds, 15 maybe too much. You have 10 big blinds, you decide to go all in, you get called and you lose. Are you thinking afterwards? And yeah, so you're thinking afterwards, maybe like, oh, that hand's a little, maybe I, I need to have a better hand there. How do you figure that out? How do you say like, oh, that I, I need to have a better hand there to be moving all in? Connor, hand is one thing. Strength of your hand is one thing. Very first thing is, as I said, reading the opponents. Okay, I'm in cutoff. I have like three players um, after me, right? So I have the big blind and small blind. What's my read on them? First of all, what kind of players are those? Is this player in big blind folding a lot of big blinds or not, right? Is this a loose player who is going to just call me off with any two random cards and put me at risk? Because post-flop, I think 
myself and a lot of players like me are pretty decent players, better players, right? Why would I give up my 10 or 12 big blind just on a race like scenario, right? Ace 10 words, king, queen suited. Maybe I don't want that, right? So my all in will be based on not just on the strength of my hand, on who is in big blind, number one, who are the people behind me after that, and also my position. Position is critical in poker, we know that, right? So here we're talking about a cutoff. Early on, if I have an ace-10 kind of hand, what do I do? So it's also based on a lot of factors, and a lot of your live reads are critical uh, on the final tables, in my opinion, and not just the strength of your hand. It's a super interesting way of looking at it and maybe more of an old school way. It does seem people are moving more towards, you know, the GTO side of things and maybe they're missing out on that by not thinking about who's this player in the big blind, how light are they going to be calling me, how much are they overfolding, things like that. Yeah, I've seen that uh, lately. GTO has its own place, I believe. Um, what is this? Game, game, game theory, theory optimization. optimization. Yeah, right. So I'm, I haven't even looked into that much, but I we joke about it, some of the players here. And uh, people call me the old school, you know, nerd. Uh, the old time player who will just, you know, who doesn't want to learn. So, which is okay, you know, that's a joke amongst with, with my nephews also. Uh, some of them, they study and they, they look at that and they, 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 they openly, they, they, they'll tell you. My uncle, he's more like an old time, you know, nerd of poker and old, old school player. And uh, I think um, GTO and calculations, that is its own place. But when you learn to play poker, the basic math and uh, number of big blinds calculation, when you should shove your stack, when you should three bet, you know, three bet fold many times, right? Many times you'll see I'm part committed, right? But many times against certain players, you are not. If he's pushing back on you, a super tight player who hasn't played a hand like last, the last three orbits, there you have ace queen uh, suited, shoving back on you, most likely ace king plus, right? Okay. You can you can decide to lay it down. It's not always, you know, uh, one size fits all applies here, or uh, you know, same solution or same strategy against every player. So that's wherein I think. Um, I have a slightly different strategy. Maybe it's old school. Maybe it's not optimal. Maybe it's not really, you know, uh, acceptable in today's world. But uh, I got to be brutally honest with you uh, on this one. I've never looked at a chart and I decline to look at any charts uh, for my ongoing uh, poker experience in the future. I don't think you need charts. So no need no need to look at them. You're, you seem to be doing just fine. So you've, you've got this very nice Team Sing mug here. You've also got it on your shirt here. You're also part of a group called Slum Donkeys. Is that right? Right. Let's talk about, let's talk about your different poker groups and, and how did those come about? Sure. Uh, let, let's perhaps start with Slum Donkey Poker because that came in first. Uh, that's, again, uh, my ex-boss. He's the one who started uh, that group. We were walking around um, um, uh, in a hallway after a tournament. And uh, there was this movie, Slum Dog Millionaire. Mm -hmm. You might be aware of it. Yeah. So he came up with this idea. How about a Slum Donkey Poker Group? I'm like, dude, that sounds sounds sound, sounds like fun. What's the purpose of this group? Like, just social group with some friends where we talk about um, basic poker strategy, upcoming tournaments, share information, add some uh, tech directors like poker directors who can share. Uh, Poker information with the group and like-minded good friends, you know, a non-profit group just for fun. So we formed that group. Uh, it's on Facebook. It's on WhatsApp. There are close to 50 members there. Uh, a lot of them are like top uh, tournament directors here from Harris. Tony Burns is there from uh, Moneymaker Tour and uh, Dania director. So a lot of directors are there. They post their, their schedules. People talk about hands there. They talk about strength of their hand. They talk about what we should have done in a certain scenario, like your question, 10 big blinds, same question. So people talk about those hands at times there. So that's to improve game and just for fun, right? So Slum Donkey group did help me a lot in the beginning. Still, I participate. I post there. And anytime you're on a final table, you have 50 people remotely uh, rooting for you in that group. That's a great feeling. 
to be honest with you it's uh, you're checking like during the breaks like oh wow great message you know and many times they share information seat number three this is the handy played against me buddy and at so and so okay that some information does help so people know other people and and they share information with you uh, from previous uh, tournaments and plays so um, that's a good way to learn that's my learning in poker if you I have to tell you, if not GTO and all, Slum Donkey Group helped me a lot, tremendously. And it's helping a lot of other upcoming players lately, right? Absolutely. So. And, you know, poker can be kind of an isolating game. It's not a team sport like other games. But it sounds like it's really helpful to have not only people supporting you, but people who you can talk about hands with or get information from. So you, it sounds like th this group has really helped you on your poker journey. Absolutely. From day one. Uh, I don't like post a lot in it lately, uh, but uh, uh, there are people who are very active there. Uh, they're talking about hands. I provide opinions and I, I'll, I'll always answer. There are other good players too. Some of the, I think there are a couple of players there. Uh, Zen Kai is in it, uh, who, who made the final table in WSOP main. Neil Blumenfield, he's there. He was the third in WSOP main. Some of the key members there. So there are many great players there jack sumner is the, is my friend who is there he's the ceo of the group so i'm here locally in south florida he's i think in jacksonville so it has helped me and it's helping a lot of other people even though poker is not a team sport but there are teams who are helping each other like team singh you talked about right that's my nephews and i right so that's harry uh Japneet, he goes by jason and sandy back in india uh them and all their friends, like T.P. Singh, you'll see, he's another Singh. Sarabjit Singh in California, that's another Singh. That's their friend. So all of them are Singh. They came up with, with an idea and logo. This was designed by Harry, my nephew, the guy who won the WSOP circuit ring. And he's like, you gotta be, we got to have this team. And they have a separate group where they talk about, you know, uncle and nephews. And uh, a lot of their friends, their age group, right, between 20 to 32, right? They are they are they have become my nephews too. Some some of the local players here, young ones, they ask me questions, they ask me for advice, and I absolutely don't mind helping them. So I always they discuss hands with me. Hey, I played this hand like that. Uh, was there another way to handle this? And this happened. So I'm like, always I'm giving them feedback, and I don't mind. I mean, they're my competition, but in the end, poker is fun for me. It's for fun. It's competition, but I'm not here like as a professional that I'm seeing my opponent just as my as my opponents and I, I, I don't have to help them. I'll always help them, anybody who's, who's going to ask me a question. That's, that's very kind of you. And I want to ask you about your most proudest, your proudest poker accomplishments. Uh, but just starting off on that, I think you had your career best score for over 400,000 earlier this year in the Lucky Hearts Poker Open Championship. Is that right? Was that your career best score? Yes, that was that was my career best score, um, uh, 486, around 487k at Hard Rock, Seminole Hard Rock. Well, congratulations on that. I know there were some great players in that. I think Jesse Lonis was one of the players who you ended up chopping with. What was that experience like for you? That was the best experience in tournament poker for me for my life. That final table. Wow. Uh, Jesse Lonis, he is a lion. Too. He is a he's a real player, uh, in my opinion. I think this guy has uh, the potential to be one of the top in the money list in the entire world, in my opinion. Take my word. On this one, I predict he's going to be one of the top ones, reaching those. Uh, if anybody has to hit a 100 million mark, he, he could be one of the guys who could do that. He's, he's a great high roller player. Uh, I don't watch much streams and all, but I've seen him win because we are Facebook friends and Twitter uh, also helps. So at, uh, he has a game that's beyond standard game, which I believe to, to win those tournaments, you'll see a lot of these pros like uh, Phil Helmio, Daniel Negreanu, they possess that. Alex Foxen, in my opinion, he was to my left in uh, Bahamas, uh, the, the main event, day one, uh, for many hours. I saw that in him also. He has the reading ability. These guys have it. Jesse Lonis has it. Uh, so I think he's a great player. Other great players, um, Brian Hastings, who can, like, he's, he's one of the amazing ones. Six bracelets. 
डब्ल्यू एस ओ पी ब्रेसलेट्स आई मीन आई एम ए फैन ऑफ ब्रांड हेस्टिंग्स वेरी डाउन टू अर्थ काय एंड एंड द नाइस काय दैन जॉनथन जाफी इज वन ऑफ द लोकल्स हियर आई थिंक ही मूव टू फ्लोरिडा और मे बी हीज फ्रॉम हियर आई डोंट नो आई कन्वर्ट्स विद हिम ड्यूरिंग द फाइनल टेबल वन ऑफ द नाइसेस गायज इन पोकर एंड ही प्लेड एक्सीडिंगली वेल द बेस्ट ही कूड Uh, he took a bad beat is jack to king jack uh, all in pre and that's how he got knocked out uh, otherwise it would have been hard for me to win if he was there uh, then there there were a couple other guys from europe i don't remember the name one gentleman he had five wsop bracelets um, and a couple more really solid players so overall all in all there was a great learning experience for me cuz i don't play a lot of these 3500s or 5000s so uh, to be able to make it to play against this quality and to be able to prevail so that was a tremendous experience for me and very fortunate and thankful for that and a lot of the guys you mentioned uh, who you see as some of the best players specifically like Alex Fox and Jesse Lawness they do seem to be like the ones who deviate from the GTO and more play the player type of strategy and so it's cool to see them succeeding at at the highest levels and and see that that playstyle works even at the highest levels yes uh, i mean that's exactly what i saw in them their ability to read uh, even uh, i mean if you go back daniel negrano phil helmuth they have that obviously um and that's a gift uh, so that does help and uh, jesse lonnie played uh, uh, tremendous poker on the final table any time i'm on, i'm on a table with him even at 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 uh, wpt day 2 he was uh, he was on my table i think day 1 or day 2 day 1 i think or day 2 day 2 sorry day 2 we were we were on the same table for many hours he played he played so well even when he was short like he goes down he'll find a way to bounce back and uh, to be able to play certain poker against certain opponents that's a the cat there and uh, he's 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 tremendously good i think he's still in final 16 uh, day 4 i no, hope he wins no yeah that's right i i was going to mention as we're recording this the uh seminal hard rock poker championship is going on uh i think it's it's probably down to a final table at this point but mm. jesse was still in last i checked so he seems to continue continue to be crushing it he's a great guy he's he's, he's one of my friends and when we chop he said i just need only one thing rami just send me over uh, one of these team sing t-shirts right so uh, then i told my nephew harry and harry sent me one then he <laughs> sent me a very nice photo of his family and everyone with their team sing shirt he's he's a down to earth guy one of one of the nicest family guys on the circuit in my opinion good he's, friend he's a great guy i covered one of his napt victories last year and we talked about his family life he's got a young child and a wife and so it it's good to see the family people doing well in this industry for sure thank you so we're wrapping up here and after this i want to go take a look at your tro- trophy collection which is very extensive but before that i i just want to ask other than the the recent lucky hearts victory what are some of your your favorite poker poker victories that you've had which ones really stick out to you I think uh, uh this one is obviously most prestigious uh, and 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 uh, for the obvious reasons uh, the great players you know I got a chance to play against uh, other than this uh, uh, there is couple more uh, I can mention about one was the WSOP circuit uh, main event ring that I won at Palm Beach Kennel Club that happened to be the last uh event there they never had uh, wsop circuit after that so i ended up winning that obviously there is no like deals or chops there was an outright that was there. a main event right main event 1700 i think uh, the buy in 1650 that time so that was worth like i think 170k irrespective of the money uh that time i dedicated that main ring to my mother she was fighting cancer uh and i took that ring back to her in india when she was going through chemotherapy she put on her finger and i can share that photo with you too you'll see uh she said she is too big for me doesn't belong here take it back so i brought it back but uh that was dedicated to it and you can see it's engraved inside the ring it's engraved from uh, raminator my friends call me that name in poker from raminator to his mother it's engraved inside that ring so that's one of the very special ones that was satisfying one that i was able to win that uh, when she was going through that and before the tournament i told my friends this is dedicated to her and that was really magical you know to be able to win uh, that tournament so there was one um 
the other one um, uh, that comes to my mind is uh, after the uh, run good uh, win at coconut creek um, uh, i was invited to uh, las vegas poker go studio my very first and only appearance there uh, as an amateur so uh, what they do is tana karn and company and brett hanks is a great commentator there too one of the best there so they team up together to bring 64 individuals in the mix around 30 the champions from various stops the main event winners throughout the year and around 30 32 the professionals and celebrities so when i played that in 2021 there uh, there were very big players there you can see My, uh, mike madisa Corey Aldemar, the, mm-hmm. the winner of uh, WSOP main there, and a lot of great players uh, there. And uh, obviously the crew, Tanakarn, Boston Rob, and uh, love those guys. They are, they are amazing. Haley, she's also Haley's there with great. them. One of the best photographers. And Absolutely. Joe, Joe there too. Joe's great the as well. Yeah. So uh, ended up playing that. That was day one and made day two. So ended up winning that. And that was one of the great moments for me. Uh, to be able to come from like as a as a recreational player winning the coconut creek tournament here um, uh, being fortunate enough to win that and then represent south florida at the big stage at, in las vegas with all these winners and professionals and to be able to prevail that and bring the trophy back to back to south florida that was great uh, for me and that same day i went to win and won that uh, other tournament, uh, luckily. That was great, last second reg. So that was great fond memories, winning the two tournaments on the, on the same day there. Well, oh, that, that's super exciting for sure. Hopefully we'll see you out in there in Vegas some more. Hopefully uh, it'll happen this year. Uh, it's my 50th birthday mm. uh, in July. So mid-July, I have commitment to travel to India because I want to celebrate my birthday with my parents. That's great. Uh, still 50 years old, almost mama's boy or love my parents. I got to go back. So I'll miss the main, but I'm planning to go to Vegas after my wife's birthday, which is in uh, on June 13th. We're taking a cruise, Royal Caribbean cruise for five days, five nights. And when we come back, perhaps late June or so, uh, I would definitely love to be there in Vegas and compete in some of those tournaments, if not multi-day ones some of those daily tournaments hopefully I can play in. Yeah, that, that'll be exciting. So just a few more general questions as we wrap up that I like asking guests just to get to know you a little better. What is a piece of advice that you would give your younger self? Well, uh, for my younger self, uh, uh, perhaps, or, or anyone uh, that age, yeah. uh, if you got to look at my nephews and all, as I mentioned earlier, uh, life, is, life is peaks and valleys always and sooner the better you know that realize that once you're on downturn or you're down you know time is very powerful it's going to change it's going to bring you up you got to work on it you got to make effort so staying positive throughout even in difficult situations is is very difficult i get it for young ones but if they can find and adapt to it and be mentally strong and believe in yourself i think that'll help them a lot in life, in work, in poker as well. That's great. And you seem like a very positive person. You, you have a, a good mindset, avoid negativity. What's something in the world that makes you hopeful? Well, I see a lot of good people helping others. That's the reason when I told you many people who come in and ask me for, for advice, I'm, I'm never going to say no. I'll discuss with them. I'll always discuss... Uh, even in business, a lot of people who will come to me, who come to me, who talk to me, I give them advice or I, I help them. The reason for that is because I was very lucky in my life to have a couple of life mentors who are still my mentors. You he- hear me talk here, give you this one hour interview, Connor, but I was a very introvert person in my life early on. With what I saw in my life, with my family go through in India and all, uh, it's not that I was carrying a burden, but I was, uh, there was a little heaviness. And uh, it was very hard for me to come out of that shell in the beginning. Even in my first job as a developer, I wasn't very social. I wouldn't talk like this. So a couple of my mentors and early on in my job, 
the Ernst and Young experience was great with Big Five Consulting. One of my bosses there, he helped me tremendously, and he was very hard on me for a reason. And then that helped me come out of my shell, and I learned. And then even for today, like on a business advice and all, I reach out to him and ask ask him. My father, he is 83 years old. Even on business advice, I call him over the weekend. I talk to him. What do you think of this decision? Right. So he'll tell me of this investment. What do you think of that? He'll give me the idea. So that makes me very hopeful because I got lucky, and I I, I was very fortunate to have people helping me. That's the reason you see me positive, and uh, you know my upbringing, my father. I told you about and mother. So you got to always pass it on. I happen to be on the on a board of uh, a university, Florida Atlantic University. That's not a paid job, right? But as a successful uh, businessman, entrepreneur, they have some CEOs and uh, and leaders in the industry to help their students and professors. So I go there, spend time with them. I coach and mentor. some of the students in masters mba um, uh, classes or masters in it and all and uh, you know that's how it's it's a cycle right today we help others others will help you know uh, the next generation so uh, hopefully my kids you know i'm not expecting anything mm-hmm. hopefully they'll find couple good mentors as well and others will help them so i strongly believe in that cycle uh, to give it back that's great all right last question uh, one thing that i love about poker is how it seems to relate to so many other areas of life and so many metaphors that can be drawn from the game what's your favorite life lesson that you think can be drawn from poker i mean poker is again uh, it's going back to the previous conversation uh, connor it's 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 if you have to equate it you know put your like uh, life your business you know your career and poker there are a lot of similarities if you see that right so in poker i have learned overall to be positive in a negative situation it's very hard to acquire that it's very hard to be taking those beats at 2 am close to the you know making day 2 losing with aces kings and those big hands and walk to the long walk to the parking lot one hour drive to to home you know and next day looking for a tournament and thinking about the whole whole what happened you know the whole scenario and all it's very like negative thing for anyone it's not a good thing but to come out of it right um those things happen throughout in poker that happen in life uh, always you know so how you bounce back uh, from that i think that's what defines uh, you know a true professional uh, in 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 a job or a, or a or a true i, I would say poker player you know mm-hmm. So you got to, you got to learn to get to that stage quickly for the young ones that'll be my advice um and uh, not harp on those bad beats and not just let it go let it go you got to let that thing go more you discuss more you talk to other people about it it's not going to change obviously but you got to find a mindset to be positive and come back and fight again next day that's a great answer Well, it's been great talking to you and I really appreciate you inviting me into your home here and and sitting down to talk to me. It's been been a fun fun conversation. Most welcome and thank you for joining coming over all the way. Sorry, I had a meeting crazy day today. So, I couldn't even get off my my seat, you know. So, uh this did really help and thanks for uh paying a visit. Yeah, of course. Happy to. Mm-hmm.